Oh, okay. Hi. I uh, had a little bit of a problem there, and things seem to be working now. So I am just going to switch over to the PowerPoint uh, that uh, I wanted to uh, walk through with you. So let's get started. Uh, share my screen. Okay. So you're here for plugging holes, securing yourself and your students online. Uh, my name is Carlo Fusco. I am a teacher librarian at uh, Waterloo Collegiate, and uh, you can find me online uh, at Mr. Fusco on Twitter. So without uh, further ado, uh, let's get ourselves started. Okay, so where I'd like to start whenever I'm working with students about uh, digital footprints and uh, basically keeping themselves safe online, I uh, always start with the vanity search. So I often will have my students Google themselves uh, using their Chromebooks or their mobile devices. The reason I, I do that is I want them to experience what a customized search looks like. After all, since it's their personal device, uh, Google does keep uh, track of sites you visit and things you do online. Uh, it will send a, a customized response. So I then have them open up an incognito tab. And from that incognito tab, I have them do a vanity search again. And sometimes they completely disappear. I know when I do it myself, uh, when I'm using my own personal device, I show up as myself. Uh, however, when I go to an incognito tab, I go to a famous Italian director. So something that you can uh, can explore with uh, students. Also, you can uh, start bringing up the, the idea of uh, when you Google somebody, is it a form of stalking or not? Uh, we put all our information out there, and it's important that uh, that we take control of that information. So when people find things, uh, they find the things we want them to find. So that leads me to uh, why digital footprints are so important. Uh, in other words, they do carry more weight uh, than a resume. And uh, I've actually had a number of employers tell me that they do search social media before they do a hire. And uh, one of the most common uh, social media sites that's used is Facebook. And I like to, to show my students this slide because uh, it just gives you a, a, some scope to the actual size of social media. So under Facebook uh, in June 2017, uh, there were 2 billion active users. So that's unique individuals logging into Facebook. YouTube was one and a half. Uh, then where I go with this is I, I talk to students about Instagram at 700 million, WhatsApp at 1.2 billion, and Facebook Messenger at 1.2. The question I often ask my students is, uh, are you a Facebook user? And they'll often say no. So I then tell them, but you are, uh, because Instagram, WhatsApp, and Facebook Messenger are all Facebook companies. And so even though you may not log into Facebook, you are providing uh, Facebook with personal information about you uh, on social media. So that uh, that surprises a lot of them. Uh, as I mentioned, we do go back to the concept of, of how social media is going to impact them in the future, uh, especially when it comes to looking for a job. Uh, this statistic, this uh, infographic I've come across shows that Facebook, Twitter, and LinkedIn are the big three, um, and that 91% of, uh, of everybody who's doing any hiring is looking on social media. And the bottom graph shows you where in the process they actually start sorting. So I talk to students about the importance of having a, a, you know, a cover letter that uh, is free of spelling errors and things like that, but also going back and cleaning up your social media site. So what do they know about you? Um, students are... are are very interested in looking at different things uh, online and uh, you end up drawing a, a picture of what you think something is like. So I always uh, show this uh, diagram where it's two sets of footprints coming together uh, and one set of footprints leaving. Students often will go straight to uh, this is one big animal meets up with a smaller animal. Uh, there's some sort of conflict and it looks as if the large animal has eaten the small animal and walks away. I then take them down a different direction where I say, what happens if the large animal was a mom and the little animal was the baby? And 
the altercation is mom trying to catch the baby. And when she finally does, she picks him up and carries him home. So two different scenarios from two from one set of tracks. The third one is we'll, we'll do a time shift. Uh, say, for example, if I'm in a science class and looking at this and getting some sort of inference from my observations, uh, say, for example, where the conflict occurs, there is a, an organism there that may have passed away. So uh, maybe we have uh, these green footsteps come walking in on a Monday, find uh, the carcass and uh, find, have a little snack on it and then walks away. And then the buzzard comes around on Thursday, four days later, uh, lands a little distance away because it doesn't know if there's any other predators around and starts walking up to it, has a little snack and flies away. So the third scenario shows that there's actually a difference in time. So students, uh, when we start talking about inference and observations and we start going back to social media, the, the question then becomes, what have you put online and what are people going to infer from that? So in other words, make sure you have a, a social media presence that's something that, uh, will, that you can be proud of. So this is actually taken on uh, something new that I, I recently come of, have come across, and that is there are now companies out there that are cleaning up social media for people. Uh, students uh, are one group, but anyone looking for a job, if you've uh, posted things online that might be problematic, uh, they have uh, services that can clean them up. But I found this interesting when uh, on Global News, they actually had a segment, uh, if you are looking for a new job, what is it that you need to clean up? And Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter are those uh, big three that uh, employers are looking at. So I did this presentation for uh, for parents uh, at a parent uh, parent council night, and uh, our our parent council president uh, came and spoke to me a couple of days later, and this was uh, the the quote I had. Um, was our child's in grade 11 and didn't have a Facebook page. We spent the weekend setting it up and we'll be posting once a week for the next year so that university's employers don't think he's hiding something. And I think parents are now starting to, to talk to students about that. A lot of them are saying they're not using Facebook. And uh, if there's nothing to be found, then employers are, are wondering what's being hidden. And uh, this parent realized that maybe we need to set something up now and post uh, intermittently so that uh, we actually see a, a history and a timeline as opposed to putting everything up uh, when you actually apply for work. Um, also, if you don't participate in social media, somebody could actually start uh, taking over your narrative and uh, you need to start building it up and, and start taking ownership. This was uh, one that uh, I found interesting. The Toronto District School Board uh, ended up having a Twitter account in 2009. The problem was it wasn't the Toronto District School Board. Uh, if it was me and I was the student, um, I probably would have tweeted out every day was a snow day uh, just to see how far I could get with that. Uh, it took a few years, but the Toronto District School Board eventually did find out that they were, uh, they were in need of a Twitter account and they couldn't get at TDSB. They had to actually do underscore official. We've seen this before. For example, the real Donald Trump uh, couldn't get his own name because he's a, an individual. Um, the Toronto District School Board, as, a, as an institution, were able to actually recover this uh, Twitter account. But I often have to remind my students that as an individual, you often can't recover it. So if somebody starts tweeting as you, uh, you have uh, really no other choice except saying things like the real or official. Uh, on your Twitter account. So you do go online, you start building up uh, your personality online, um, but sometimes things can go wrong. So uh, since this is a relatively new thing, I, I do wanna just touch on uh, Facebook, Cambridge Analytica, and why everyone's talking about privacy right now. Uh, after all, social media is important for us if we're trying to build uh, some sort of online presence that puts us in a positive light. Um, but what happens to that information? So I talk to students about privacy and uh, we talk about when was it born and privacy pretty much didn't exist, uh, you know, 3000 years ago. Uh, reason being we are living in, uh, in communities 
and uh, our building structures uh, didn't have any walls. So what ended up happening was we were living communally, sharing space, and therefore not having any real privacy. Uh, about 15 AD, 1500 AD, uh, things started to change. Uh, building structures started to have internal walls so that people could have their own room. Uh, in the 15th century, with the invention of the printing press, uh, silent reading came about, and then people started to uh, try and find solitude. Bubonic plague was the big one. Uh, again, why? Uh, prior to uh, bubonic plague, there was uh, shared beds. Uh, there would be communal beds. Uh, the reason is you would share a bed for warmth, and I often would show students the opening scene from uh, Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory where all the grandparents are in bed together, and it, it just causes some, some laughs in class, but then we talk about bubonic plague and how being in contact with someone could end up making you sick, so uh, privacy and, and separate rooms started to really come about. Uh, when did uh, privacy start to disappear? That's happening today. Uh, we have FOMO, fear of missing out. Also, we have uh, an exchange of privacy for convenience. For example, I don't mind letting Google know where I am using my cell phone because somehow it's giving me traffic information, it's telling me where I've parked my car, um, and giving me weather notices when uh, something is occurring. So I am exchanging that. I understand I'm giving up some privacy, but I find that the convenience and the reward I get from that is, is quite important. So let's go back to Cambridge Analytica and Facebook. Um, some of these sites uh, sometimes don't have a, a really strong grasp of your information. So a few years ago, uh, there was a quiz online uh, on Facebook where uh, 270,000 people took a personality quiz. There were some settings in Facebook that allowed those people who took the quiz to uh, share their information about their friends to the company that was doing the um, doing the quiz and it was uh, estimated that 50 million people uh, had their personal information leaked to this company called Cambridge Analytica but by April that changed to about 87 million and of that 600,000 of those were were Canadians the reason why this is important is it was by using these personality traits that uh, targeted advertisements took place during the American election. And uh, some of the questions that came from that was uh, how it affected the election. And as Ontario is now moving very close to its own election, there have been uh, political parties that have used Cambridge Analytica to target advertisements to the Canadian population as well. So what ends up happening as, uh, as information is leaked, we go through roughly the same, same, uh, same, uh, chain of events. We have the apology, uh, then we have the response from advertisers who pull their advertising, uh, then we have people that are trolling and, and making fun. So here's Elon Musk from SpaceX and Tesla uh, making uh, what's Facebook comment. Um, then uh, things like Cambridge Analytica real realize that there's a fair amount of pressure, decide to shut down and then reopen under another name. So Emmer, Emmer Data will be the new name for Cambridge Analytica. Now, with this whole idea of sharing information, we have to keep in mind that we're the ones who are making these choices. Uh, the, the question I often ask students again is, when was the last time you read an end user license agreement? And none of them have. They just quickly click on the OK and move on. And uh, during an interview, Mark Zuckerberg of, of Facebook had actually said that we did click OK for us to share information with these third party companies. So that caused a change uh, in the way people are thinking about their privacy. So the Electronic Frontier Foundation, uh, the F EFF, have actually started putting uh, things online to help you understand what's going on. Uh, so they put up instructions on how to opt out of uh, that information sharing and actually developed a online course that you can take to train you to teach yourself about uh, how to not be surveilled. So what are you actually sharing online? And uh, there's a, a Twitter uh, in, a personality by the name of Dylan Curran uh, who often will share things that uh, he has found online for you to explore what it is you're sharing. And uh, 
it's actually quite interesting. I have the links here uh, to the big three. So in other words, Google, you can actually go to takeout.google.com and you can download everything that you've ever put on Google, everything from your searches to what images you've looked at and to even what ads you've clicked on. It's all there. You can actually download it and take a look at it. Now, the good side of this is I have my students uh, do this. We're a, a Google Apps for Education school board. And when our grade 12s graduate, uh, they lose access to their Google accounts. So I always have them go to Google Takeout to take out all their stuff and save it to their personal Google account uh, so they don't lose anything. But uh, you can actually see everything that's there uh, in your Google account. The next one is Twitter. If you go into the settings there, you can actually request an archive of every single thing you've done on Twitter. It'll actually be searchable, and you can actually go and look at it. Facebook has something similar. It's, uh, it's uh, a button in the settings, in the general settings, where you can actually download a copy of all your Facebook data and see what's there. So if you're ever curious about uh, some of the stuff you've done online on any of these three services, this is a nice, easy way to do that. Other things that uh, I like to share with my students is about how sometimes their personal devices are, are leaking information. So one of the sites I use is called I Know Where Your Cat Lives. And when you click on this, uh, it shows you a picture of a cat. But it's not just any cat. Uh, this site. They, they were researchers that were interested in, in looking at the amount of information people are sharing. So they went on a social media and uh, took 10 million pictures of cats worldwide. And they used the GPS data that's embedded in the, in the uh, photos that was put there by cell phones because cell phones have a GPS chip in them. And they started plotting all the cat pictures. And what's interesting about that is that you see Inadvertently, people are sharing pictures of what's in their homes or where they, they tend to congregate and things like that. So whenever I show this website in class, students will, uh, this usually derails my class for about 10 minutes. And, and what ends up happening is people are all searching their neighborhoods. And it's a, it's a great little site uh, to see what type of information is leaking. So what do you do moving forward so you're not leaking all that kind of information? I talked to my students about what it's actually called. It's called EXIF data. And uh, whenever you take a photograph, uh, it, it puts the date, the image, what device, and the GPS data, as so you can see in the image on the right. And I remind them to always turn off location services in any of these types of apps. And by doing so, the GPS data is stripped out. So if they do share a photograph online, they're not giving up location information with it. Also, surfing online, uh, if you'd like something to, to reduce the amount of cookies that are tracking you, uh, Privacy Badger from the Electronic Frontier Foundation works great. Uh, what this does is it allows you to have a relationship with the company. So for example, you log in to Google, and then you uh, go to another Google site. You don't have to log in again because that cookie is carrying your password with you but it's not letting it take any third party. So it's, you're not getting a cookie from an advertiser following you as well. And we've seen that where you do one search and then everywhere you go, you see if, uh, an advertisement for that thing you were searching for. This stops that from happening. However, if you do care about a nuclear option, uh, uBlock Origin is my favorite. This is probably my favorite uh, 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 ad blocker. Uh, the reason is it's just very simple to use. It's an on-off switch. If a website doesn't work properly, I can turn it off, reload the page, and, and things do work. And what I found at uh, school, when you have limited bandwidth, is that this will speed up your, your downloads quite dramatically, and your web pages should load faster. Also on cell phones, take the time to actually go into the app permissions and set things so that uh, you share what you want to share, uh, again, are you what are you exchanging for this information? So if it's not providing you with some sort of convenience, then you might want to stop the sharing. Also, you want to take a look at this website. Troy Hunt is uh, one of those Microsoft researchers who is constantly looking at, uh, at the uh, underground, the underbelly of, of leaked databases to websites. And he, he, he goes into these groups and is actually able to retrieve these databases. And he put it into a website so you can actually start to see 
what information is leaking. So you put your email address in, and when you click on it, it will throw up what uh, your, that email address, what leaks it's been associated with. So for example, you see the red square here, that was on uh, my search, and I found out that uh, I had bought a copy of uh, Adobe Photoshop one time, and it got uh, hacked, the database was leaked, and it turns out that somebody was able to get my username and password from that database. The interesting thing about that is if I had reused that password anywhere else, they now have complete login information for me on other sites. So it's important that we have unique website or unique passwords for every site. Um, students also have to be aware that they shouldn't be sharing their passwords with anyone. Uh, something I've seen at school in the past is uh, friends will share passwords with each other as a test of friendships. So I tell them that's not uh, that's not acceptable. Uh, the reason is their friends are the ones most likely to hijack their site and uh, start posting as them, and again damaging their reputation. And speaking of passwords, uh, students always get a kick out of this. This is uh, from Wikipedia, and uh, these are the top ten passwords over the last few years. And as you can see, they're not very robust. One, two, three, four, five, six is in the top two, as is the word password. So uh, again, talking to students about having good passwords that are easy to remember or uh, robust enough. In other words, don't reuse them because if you are part of a breach, uh, that information can be used. So I talked to them about using password managers. And for me, my favorite is LastPass. The reason is, I remember one very complex password and then it keeps all the other passwords for me. So as I go to the different sites, it does the login for me. Uh, if you're not a LastPass uh, fan, there's also 1Password and KeePass. There's a lot of different ones you can try. Uh, I, I choose LastPass because it is the number one out there and because people are always trying to hack it, uh, that they do the repairs on that uh, piece of software very quickly. They let you know that the, that it's been uh, that it's been uh, updated, and it really makes sure that the uh, the software is robust and, and not open to attack. So it is one of my favorites. So to end, again, we talk to students about why we go online. You know, this sounds like something that should be scaring you, uh, but it doesn't have to. After all, we go online for a multitude of reasons. When I talk to students, they're on there looking for jobs. They connect with friends. They're, they're doing, they're learning there, they're being entertained, they go shopping. Well, maybe that's me, I love my Amazon account. Uh, they go gaming and uh, creative expression. Uh, a lot of kids actually have their own YouTube channels and they get to meet people that uh, share their interests. So that is the whole presentation. I hope you, uh, hope you like it and uh, I hope you found it useful. Uh, I am, again, always on Facebook. And if you would like to uh, connect with me and talk to me about uh, digital citizenship and or about uh, security online, I'm always available. Uh, you might also want to keep an eye out for the Digital Citizenship Summit in October at OISE here in Toronto, Ontario. And uh, we will be looking at this uh, uh, as a full day event. Okay, so if there's, uh, I'm just looking at the YouTube account. Is there Uh, nothing in the live chat. So I'm going to uh, end it there and say thank you very much. And again, you can find me on Twitter at MRFUSCO. Thank you and uh, enjoy the rest of the PD today.